who have actually um, entered this room. So <clears throat> thank you so much for your interest in coming over on today's SOAS China Institute seminar. Um, my name is Huan Zhou. I'm a reader in international management at the School of Finance and Management um, at SOAS uh, University of London. Um, I'm quite delighted today. We actually going to have a very fantastic seminar, which is exactly the perfect topic under the conference, the COP26 now actually entered the second week in Glasgow. There are lots of discussion for the world leaders to discuss about how important we achieve certain kinds of collective for, um, cooperation among over 130 countries. So today's topic, we're gonna to focus particularly on one of the key issues talking about carbon neutrality, which you know the different countries have their own agendas. Um, now, before I introduce Professor Ming Xu, today's to, um, speaker, um, I would like to have certain kinds of housekeeping issues. So for the webinar, um, you're more than welcome to raise any questions or comments through the Q&A box at the bottom right hand corner of the screen. And if you would like to raise the question anonymously, definitely you're welcome to do so. But if you can let me know, um, you know, um, a little bit more about your background, and then this will definitely help me to actually understand the question that you propose and forward to Professor Ming Xu um, to answer it. Um, but your wish will be definitely respected, neither your name or other things which will identify your identity and profile will not be disclosed at all. So as you can see on this slide, um, today's talk speaker is Professor Ming Xu. So he actually holds the professorship in School of Environment and Sustainability um, in the Department of Civil and, Engin Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Michigan. Um, he actually also holds the inaugural directorship of the China program um, in the same university. Um, to be honest, that he's such an emerging star in this particular area because he has received a number of important awards and to recognize his work in the environmental sustainability aspect. So for example, that he received the 2015 Robert A. Lodice Medal from International Society for Industrial Ecology and the National Science Foundation Faculty Early Career Development Award in 2016 and the Water Air Huber Civil Engineering Research Prize from American Society of Civil Engineer in 2021. Definitely there is a long list that I would not really have the time and to, to actually go through. But I would like to think, you know, today Ming will give us a very good understanding of his research in carbon neutrality and also particularly his interdisciplinary research expertise to bring the climate change and how industry ecology can come into the picture will actually help us to think about what exactly the different multiple stakeholders can contribute to this big agenda. Now I will hand over to Professor Xu for the presentation and then we will come back with the Q&A for some inspiring and exciting conversation on this topic. So here the floor is yours, Ming. Great, uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, uh, thank you for uh, a uh, nice introduction and for the invitation to uh, participate in this seminar series. Um, so as uh, as uh, uh, Juan mentioned, um, so the top topic of today, um, I want to talk about carbon neutrality and the life cycle thinking. So carbon neutrality, I think, is pretty popular terms these days, especially uh, given the what's happening right now in Glasgow. Um, life cycle thinking that is a a, a way of uh, of thinking in in our research uh, area in our research field. Um, so I want to combine those two together to see how. Uh, life cycle thinking and our research can help uh, carbon neutrality. Right? Um, so, I will uh, today um, I'll have uh, you know uh, divide this uh, um, talk in roughly uh, three parts. First, uh, what is carbon neutrality and how can we achieve carbon neutrality? You know, by you know my own opinion, uh, what is uh, life cycle thinking and how can it help uh, carbon neutrality? And lastly. What are the uh, some of the challenges and the solutions in life cycle uh, analysis? Okay? Um, particularly some of the research we are doing to address those challenges. So first, 
what is carbon neutrality and how can we achieve carbon neutrality? So um, since this is a seminar hosted by the China Institute, I, start, I, will, I want to start with China. Um, last year in September, uh, China has officially uh, pledged to uh, achieve carbon peak by 2030 and then by, right? Uh, on the lower left corner, you will see a graph I you know, draw uh, using my hand. There's no uh, serious research behind it. It's just how I think uh, China will, uh, the pathway uh, for China to achieve carbon peak and the carbon neutrality in until uh, 2060. And there are many uh, research uh, groups are doing uh, serious research on that, like identify the uh, uh, pathway, pathways and identify technology policy and, and et cetera, uh, to, uh, which can help us to achieve those uh, uh, pathways. So, but in general, I think <clears throat> uh, right now in, 20, in 2020, right now, China uh, uh, generate about uh, 10 gigaton of uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions a, a year. Um, since the peak will happen in 2030, I think you know from now on to 2030, around 2030, um, the, the the emission annual emission will still uh, going up. Uh, in 2030 to 2035, roughly you know, those five five year five ish years, um, the the emission annual emission will reach to a plateau and probably you know a little bit up, a little bit down. Um, but then after 2035, uh, roughly that time, um, the, the kind of technology and the market conditions and the policies to achieve rapid reduction of carbon emissions are probably already by then. Uh, those are not ready at this point. Um, so they are ready uh, by you know, around 2035, uh, then we will probably see a rapid decline of uh, uh, carbon emissions over the, uh, the years. And by the end of this uh, period, uh, after 2050 or even 2055, um, most of the emission that, that can be reduced have been reduced, but there are still some emissions that cannot be re removed easily, right? Or, or avoided easily. So then uh, um, technology, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, additional carbon sink, uh, forestry, et cetera, will come into play to neutralize those additional emissions. So by 2060, if China achieves carbon neutrality, uh, it doesn't mean that there's no emissions. It's just mean whatever emissions you generate will be uh, offset by some, some other uh, mechanisms. So, um, since this is a, um, uh, you know, for people familiar with China, so this, since this is a very top uh, uh, national strategy, national policy for, for China. So this will not just be a, a, a matter of emission reduction, not a matter of just the energy transition. As, Professor, uh, as President Xi said, it will be an extensive and a profound a systemic reform for the economy and society. So every industry, every sectors, Everybody will be uh, uh, affected one way or another by this uh, process. Right? So this is what's happening. And uh, but if you look at it globally, uh, by um, June twenty uh, this year, uh, there were uh, one hundred thirty seven countries uh, to carbon neutrality. Uh, so this is a map. Probably the the the, the, the words are too small, so you don't need to worry too much about that. And essentially, what they tell us is that most of those uh, 37 countries have uh, committed to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 uh, in line with Paris Agreement uh, goals. Some and some uh, later, a little bit later, right? Um, so what, uh, what, what's ha what happened in the last week at COP26 was that two additional countries, big countries have also made a commitment. Australia committed to uh, reach carbon neutrality, they call net zero emissions in 50, and India uh, committed to uh, reach net zero emission by 2070, right? So after those two countries joined, most of the main economies in the world have joined this, uh, this race of, to achieve carbon neutrality. So carbon neutrality has become a, you know, almost like a global uh, consensus right now. 
Um, so how do we achieve carbon neutrality? Um, there are technology, there are, are um, technical, there are policy solutions, there are market, market solutions, but no matter what kind of solutions, I think uh, they, can all, they can all be characterized in two broader uh, production-based approach and a consumption-based approach. So um, production-based approach essentially means, um, let's take a look at the take inventory, uh, take the stock of uh, who emitted how much emissions, right? The, the power sector generated this much, the transportation sector generated that much. And then let's just, just try to um, uh, figure out how to make those big emitters reduce their emissions, right? Which uh, power plants uh, generate how much emissions and next year, you know, through policy mechanism or through technology, through uh, marketing me uh, mechanisms, let's just try to get these power plants reduce this emission by 20% next year, 40%, eventually by 2050 or 2060, uh, goes to zero, right? Um, so this will be a project is mostly is like a top-down policy driven. So like uh, uh, carbon trading, uh, which is popular in the US, in, in Europe, and also essentially is a production-based approach. So essentially the, the heavy polluting industries are which are included in the carbon trading market are, are, are given quotas for emissions for next year. And then uh, if you, um, uh, you need more uh, quotas, you go to the market to buy from somebody else. And you, you, if you have extra that you don't need to use, you can sell those quotas, emission quotas on, uh, in the market and get some uh, money back, right? But uh, the, the market, carbon market essentially just as a market mechanism to allocate, effectively allocate those uh, emission quotas. Uh, but essentially, it's a still a production-based approach. So uh, in contrast, there's another big category of uh, approach I call a consumption-based approach. So in consumption-based approach, uh, worry about who actually generate how much emissions. We only need to uh, worry about one uh, particular uh, phase of the social economic consumption. Right? So let's take a look at the consumption here. Uh, if we can uh, calculate, measure the carbon footprint of this consumption, I uh, use a consumption of a car, consumption of uh, uh, some sort of service, right? And then, uh, and then we figure out some ways to, uh, to reduce the carbon footprint of this consumption. And if we can reduce the carbon footprint of this consumption to zero, that means the whole supply chain that supports this consumption uh, are, are reduced, uh, the this whole supply chain are reduced to zero. So that's essentially is carbon neutrality, right? Um, so then a consumption-based approach is a bottom-up approach, mostly driven. Um, there, you know, the key concept for consumption-based approach is carbon footprint. Carbon footprint essentially means the supply chain emission from all the, uh, all the uh, uh, components in the supply chain that supports a particular kind of consumption. So the um, carbon footprint and supply chain emission is, is what we, uh, we, we, we call life cycle thinking in, in our research uh, field. Of course, you know, production-based, consumption-based, those are coming hand in hand and they're not uh, uh, against each other. So we don't need to choose one over another. They work together, right? We need both. Um, so uh, in addition to those countries, there are many uh, so-called non-state actors uh, also commit to uh, make commitments relevant to carbon neutrality. So for those actors, um, mostly they're what they uh, committed uh, was to reduce their carbon footprint from the uh, consumption uh, based. So this is from by October 19, uh, 19 this year. Uh, there were there were 194 countries. Uh, this is different from the previous 137, 137, 137 countries committed to carbon neutrality. But here it says just uh, uh, 194 countries uh, adopt some actions contributing to carbon neutrality, right? It's more broader. But also uh, 200 plus regions, 1,200 plus investors, 2,000 plus organizations, 7,000 plus companies, and 10,000 plus cities have 
committed to do something for carbon neutrality, right? So here's uh, another uh, a graph shows uh, Fortune 500 companies, their commitments to carbon neutrality. Some are commit, have committed to keep carbon neutrality, some uh, are committed to reduce emissions by a certain percentage, for example, right? Um, so give you some examples, for example, the, this is Microsoft has uh, promised to achieve not only just carbon neutrality, but uh, carbon negative by 2030, right? Not only reduce our, their to zero, but even you know further to be negative. Um, so the the scope, the carbon uh, emission they considered uh, as their footprint include two parts. First is this uh, red portion, which is the emissions coming from micro, Microsoft itself, Microsoft Office, Microsoft you know uh, factories, etc. Um, but uh, the majority of the emission they want to reduce is this blue bars, which is the uh, soft supply chain emissions, right? Which means those are emissions coming from Microsoft um, suppliers, not Microsoft itself, right? But Microsoft will commit to reduce those emissions as well. So those are essentially a life cycle thinking and also carbon footprint. Walmart. Walmart also uh, committed to uh, achieve zero emission by 2040, right? Uh, their uh, uh, commitment also includes not only just emissions coming from their stores, from their offices, also from the supply chain, their supply chain. So uh, anything that Walmart sells uh, has a unique supply chain, even you know, most likely is a very globalized supply chain. So those emissions coming from the supply chains are also will be considered by Mark, uh, Walmart uh, to achieve their um, emission. Uh, reduction targets by 2040. Right? Um, so there are many other uh, uh, examples. Right? So why do those companies do this? Right? Um, I think first of all they they have a lot of uh, challenges because of carbon neutrality uh, and because of climate change. First, for example, the change. For example, in China, the carbon trading market right now is only uh, includes uh, the power sector, but uh, there are clear in the Indication that uh, heavy uh, industries will be considered will be included in the carbon trading system uh, in next uh, uh, couple of years, right? So for those industry, for transportation industry companies in those uh, sectors, they know their the, the, the new policy will come in. So this is a challenge for them. They need to get prepared. Societal pressure. So Microsoft has committed to achieve carbon negative by twenty thirty. Um, its competitors in the same industry will have a pressure from, uh, from, from the society, right? Investor demand, uh, now right now, these days, a lot of investors, in, um, in addition to looking for going out to returns, but also for uh, considering a so-called ESG, environment, uh, social and governance of their companies, uh, businesses they invest in. Environmental, in, in the environmental aspect, climate change, uh, carbon re, uh, emission reduction is a major component. Consumer prefer, uh, uh, preference, um, you guys in, in the UK, you should know this much better than I do. Uh, there are many uh, new generation of consumers that are very environmentally uh, conscious and climate conscious. So they, they have a uh, uh, new preference in terms of the products and services they buy. Uh, export risk for countries uh, export uh, products to other countries, especially in Europe. Uh, carbon border adjustment tax, European Union have uh, started to uh, this uh, new new policy that will charge uh, export exporting companies uh, uh, by the emissions based on the emissions they uh, generated during the production of those products. Right? So those will be another challenge for those companies that export it. Uh, most, more directly, supply chain risk due to climate change. The flood happened in uh, Europe this summer and also the uh, flood in China has um, posed a lot of uh, uh, short-term uh, impact on some uh, supply chains for some industries. Right? Uh, in addition to those challenges, there are also uh, opportunities. 
a new market, um, the hot companies that uh, are doing good in terms of carbon neutrality, and also if a company has new uh, low carbon or carbon neutral products that will gain edge, uh, new image, socially responsible companies uh, also uh, will receive more, re attract and retain the con consumers. Uh, new revenue sources. So if a company participate in a carbon trading scheme, uh, they could get financial returns uh, from the emissions reduced. So here's an interesting story happened in uh, May this year. Uh, Dutch uh, uh, Shell was sued by uh, some uh, uh, environmental NGOs in the Netherlands, and the court ruled that uh, Shell need to cut their supply chain emissions by 45. Uh, by 2030%. Um, so this is a very unique uh, case because the court ruled uh, that Shell needs to reduct, reduce emissions, but the emissions are including not only just the emission coming from Shell itself, but it's a supply chain emission. So this is a very clear indication that uh, uh, policy and the lawmakers are uh, emission reduction from the supply chain perspective, not only just uh, looking at the emissions directly coming from somebody. So the supply chain essentially means, uh, supply emission essentially means carbon footprint, which is a life cycle thinking in our field. So we, uh, to, to monitor and reduce carbon footprint essentially is to reduce chain emissions. And if every uh, product's carbon footprint becomes zero, then our society will achieve um, carbon neutrality. So that's first what is carbon neutrality and how can we achieve that. The second I want to uh, talk a little bit more about what is the life cycle thinking and how can it help uh, carbon neutrality. So um, life cycle thinking essentially is uh, uh, to say that when we consider a product's life uh, environmental impact, we should consider its whole so-called life cycle. A product's life cycle includes uh, from the raw material extraction to material processing, manufacturing, uh, assembling, use, and uh, uh, end of life. At the end of life, some parts of the material, some part of the products are recycled, reused back to this uh, supply chain system, and some becomes waste being finally disposed. So environmental impacts happening at every stage of this uh, uh, supply, uh, this life cycle. So. Uh, the true environmental impact of uh, a product uh, it should include the impacts coming from all those processes. Why do we need a, a life cycle thing? What difference can life cycle thinking make? Here's a very classic example uh, based on a paper published in Science in 1991, which compared the life use and air, em air emissions of uh, uh, paper products and uh, the plastic products, for example, paper bags and plastic bags, and uh, the comparison certainly equivalency. So that means um, the 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 whatever number of uh, plastic bags is equivalent to whatever number of uh, paper bags they can carry things for the same number of times. Right. Um, so when we speak, when we talk about the plastics, we uh, uh, this kind of image is often pops up, mind, uh, which is you know. Uh, why we have a lot of uh, policies against the uh, use of plastics. Um, but if you think about this from a life cycle perspective, this kind of things happens only at uh, 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 one particular phase of the life cycle, life, cycle think, life cycle of the plastics, which is the, an end of life when plastic becomes waste. And if we don't uh, treat them properly uh, and just discard them in the environment, this is what will happen, what will happen. Um, but if we think about the, the, uh, this question from the entire life cycle perspective, from the material extraction to end of life, and also not only just the impact on the ecosystem, but also the impact on energy use, air emissions. Based on this research, plastic is much better than papers because from in the life cycle, it use less energy, generate less uh, air emissions. But of course, this is not to say that we should use, continue to use plastics, especially in you know, a single use plastic. This is only saying to say that when we think about the product's environmental impact, it really depends, depends on a lot of factors. First, 
what is the system scope, scope of system, a system boundary. What are included in the in the life cycle? Are we only looking at one particular phase of the life cycle or the whole life cycle? Right. And second, what environmental impacts are we uh, considering? If we only considering the uh, impact on ecosystem, of course, plastic is is worse because it's, it takes a long time to degrade in the environment. But if our concerns are energy use and air emissions, air pollution, then uh, the story and the answer might be different. So um, life cycle thinking give us essentially a, a new perspective to uh, uh, when we impact on that. So life cycle thinking has been used um, a lot actually in public policy uh, in a, at a global scale. Uh, we know that IPCC uh, produce uh, annual assessment report every couple of years. Uh, the most recent one is uh, six uh, uh, released in this next year. Uh, so the last one was released in 2013 and 14. There was one, uh, a lot of context in the reports talking about issue called emission embodied in trade, meaning uh, uh, producing country, country producing products generate emissions during the production, but the products are produced for another country's consumption. So which country should be responsible for that emission, the producing country or the consuming country or both, right? So that actually also is a, a, one of the topics that those COP uh, conferences uh, are, are have uh, been discussing. Um, so the behind the, the, the thing, this is essentially thinking, you know, producing from in one country and uh, consuming in another country. Um, at the regional um, the national level, uh, in China, uh, the industrial industry and the information has uh, serious policies around so-called eco-design product to encourage companies to design their product uh, for life cycle environmental impact minimization, not only just to uh, uh, have a less energy consumption, less environment impact during the use phase, but from the whole life cycle. In Europe, uh, product environmental footprint uh, some products are required to disclose their so-called product environment. Um, so the environment footprint is a life cycle thinking. And also, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, part of the EU Green Deal uh, has a carbon ball mechanism in discussion, which will uh, impose new taxes on imported products based on the emissions generated from the production in the country. So that's also kind of a, life cycle thinking. Um, at a company level, many companies are doing social responsibility uh, activities. One of the things they do is to calculate, measure, uh, and disclose uh, their monitor their carbon footprint or water footprint for some companies that were close to water. Uh, no matter what kind of footprint, uh, it's a life cycle uh, thinking, a life cycle concept. Um, there's the life cycle assessment or LCA. Uh, LCA life cycle assessment is a methodology. It's uh, essentially as the implementation of the life. Cycle. We use this methodology to uh, quantitatively uh, measure the environmental impacts of uh, a product uh, from its uh, life cycle. So the, the method is also pretty straightforward. We just uh, figure out what processes are involved in the life cycle of the, uh, of the product. And then see at each process, uh, how much, what kind of resources are being used, how much, what kind of energy being used, and how much, what kind of uh, waste has been generated. So here we're talking about environmental impacts. It's broadly speaking, not only just the emissions, but resources use, energy use, and the, you know, other uh, emissions, uh, waste. So the first LCA actually uh, people are, are, are people think the first LCA was conducted, conducted by uh, Coca-Cola in 1970s uh, when, when they uh, was planning to introduce uh, bottles, the beverage containers. Right? So they did economic analysis, they did uh, uh, food safety analysis, and then they uh, want, want to see what's the environmental impact to avoid any you know, accusations from environmental NGOs. So they outsourced uh, a third uh, um, uh, a third-party uh, uh, group to 
uh, analysis for by back then it was not called life cycle assessment, but essentially it was a life cycle assessment. So they eventually they figured out that during from the life cycle, plastic bottles actually reduce um, environmental impacts into in some categories. But based on that result uh, and together with their you know economic uh, food safety analysis results, they uh, introduced the plastic bottles as a, a, a beverage containers. Uh, right now, today, uh, life cycle assessment used in industries and uh, uh, academia. So, um, what uh, life cycle thinking can do uh, for carbon neutral? Well, I think there are three uh, roles that life cycle thinking can play uh, to achieve carbon neutrality. And first, uh, since this uh, seminar organized by China, we have a Chinese name called UD function, which means life cycle thinking, life cycle analysis can help us to identify those key processes in a product's life, which generate um, larger amount of emissions. So that's where we can make uh, potentially make large amount of reduction uh, through policy uh, of technology improvement. Uh, so okay, uh, one of the examples is uh, uh, bioenergy technology. So uh, five, so in the US, uh, bioenergy was, uh, was very uh, popular uh, in, in the market and also in the, uh, from the government perspective, there are a lot of subsidies. Um, in order to uh, qualify for those subsidies or uh, tax uh, benefits, those, those bioenergy companies should uh, prove that uh, among many other things, uh, uh, they, their technology, their en uh, energy product can reduce life cycle greenhouse gas emissions compared to a fossil fuel uh, counterpart. Um, so then uh, um, those companies uh, ask, you know, uh, university professors or consulting companies to help do those kind of analysis, right? So this is a work we did for a company uh, which use switchgrass um, to produce bioenergy. Bio so it's kind of thing like this uh, has a lot of uh, uh, grew, a lot of those things in the uh, Midwest Plains. Um, so we found that if they can use this to produce electricity or they can use this to produce liquid fuel, right? So we found that uh, to use the switchgrass to produce uh, electricity, uh, the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions is, is lower than producing uh, liquid fuel, bioethanol. So uh, lower emissions means potentially lower reduction from the fossil fuel counterpart. Uh, mean, means it means uh, potentially a higher rebate, a higher higher uh, subsidies they can get from the government. Right? It's also one to know, uh, in future technology development, what what else can they do, or where should they focus on to do further reduce uh, green? Right? We also we figure out uh, no matter uh, which pathways you go to, uh, electricity or biofuel. Uh, the most uh, the emission, most uh, uh, emissions coming from the agriculture pro uh, process and the logistics, right? Logistics, there's not much uh, they can do because the the fuel, the, the crop is there and the, uh, the switchgrass is there and the, the power plants or biorefinery is there. You, you cannot move them around, right? Uh, what they can do is actually in the agriculture phase. There are a lot of uncertainties means different agriculture practice uh, will generate different amount of emissions. And then we look further to see which in the agriculture phase generate emissions. Essentially, it's dominated by the emissions produced, emission coming from the production of fertilizer and also the emission coming from uh, the, the fertilizer use, essentially the NO2 emissions, which is also a very powerful greenhouse, greenhouse gas emission. So this essentially tells those companies, um, if you want to further reduce emissions, try to reduce your nitrogen fertilizer use uh, using your uh, organic fertilizer or some other uh, ways to reduce fertilizer use. Right? Um, so that's one example. Uh, so the second role that I think life cycle thinking uh, can play uh, for carbon neutrality is uh, uh, show do day two in, chi in Chinese, which means that oftentimes we see a reduction of emissions uh, 
um, um, happening in one particular phase of the life of the life cycle, but actually it essentially being shifted to another phase from the whole life cycle, from a whole system perspective, the emission actually has not been reduced. It's just moved, been moved from one place to another place. Uh, with a life cycle thinking, a life cycle perspective, we can uh, measure the emissions from the whole uh, system scope uh, perspective without, you know, those, uh, to avoid those environmental burden shifts. So here, the, the classic example is electric vehicle. Um, Chinese here says uh, zero emission. So that's often what people uh, uh, say when we first, uh, you know, the, got uh, introduced uh, electric vehicles. Um, so we know that uh, right now, we, most of people will know that there, zero emission essentially means there's no tailpipe emissions from user vehicle. But from the uh, life cycle perspective, it might be not be the case. So the uh, vehicle, the car's life cycle has two parts. First is this vertical uh, um, um, axis, which means uh, it's the life cycle of the car itself, the physical product that we buy. Um, uh, from raw material uh, extraction, you know, uh, steel, um, you know, glass, you know, copper, etc., uh, rubber, right, and then uh, pr processing, uh, making parts, parts being assembled to become a car after you end of life. Uh, some parts of car being recycled, reused, come back to the system, and some become being finally disposed. Uh, in addition to have a car, we also need uh, um, energy, right? For, for gas, car, it's gas. Then the gas, its own uh, life cycle, um, oil extraction, refinery, and uh, uh, processing, and then the use during the use phase, you know, generate a lot of emissions. Also emissions from other uh, phases of the life cycle. Uh, for an electric vehicle, uh, the vertical aspect of the, the car itself is you know, largely similar, except an electric vehicle has a larger uh, battery pack. So the battery itself has its own life cycle, raw material from raw material extract, extraction to in a life recycling, reuse and disposal. For electric vehicle, we don't need to use gas, but we need to use energy, uh, electricity. Uh, electricity has to come from somewhere, right? Um, if we use coal or, uh, to produce electricity, we can imagine that the emission coming from the electricity generation uh, probably will be very large. And even if we use uh, solar, solar energy or wind energy, the production from the production of wind turbines and solar panels also emissions coming from those uh, processes, right? So using electric vehicle, essentially it's just, just to move shift the tail from a gas car to the power generation. So if our power grid is not clean enough, we probably will not reduce too much of emissions, right? Here's an example from the US. Um, in the US, uh, this, this is called a Midwest region. This is where uh, University of Michigan is located in the state of Michigan. Region, the, the power grid is uh, dominated by coal actually. Uh, you, uh, the use of uh, uh, natural gas and uh, uh, renewable uh, relatively less. In Northeast, South Florida, in Texas, and uh, the West Coast, uh, those places, uh, they use, uh, use natural gas and uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, renewable energy uh, uh, relatively more. So if we use electricity, we us here generate much more emissions and those places you will generate less emissions. Right? Um, so lastly, uh, I think life cycle thinking can to, um, I, I call it women that means we, as we, I, I said earlier, it's from a consumption perspective to reduce emissions. Uh, we uh, help uh, the consumers to know the carbon footprint of products and uh, help them to make informed uh, decisions. Uh, purchasing decisions and trend and that signal uh, being translate transformed uh, translate to uh, the production practices in upstream of supply chain. So um, I think you know in Europe, uh, uh, you guys will uh, a lot of those products have now have a carbon uh, label, right? For example, this uh, uh, milk 
voxel milk has a carbon footprint of 800 gram. So if uh, environment which just uh, uh, consumers uh, buy uh, low carbon footprint um, uh, products, that signal will be the produce and they will try uh, to reduce their carbon footprint uh, at the same time, you know, uh, when, when they improve the quality of the products, right? So eventually if this label becomes zero, so zero uh, carbon footprint, then the supply chain, there's no emissions coming from the whole supply chain uh, in this milk, for this milk, right? All the products we, we, we use, we buy, becomes zero, zero emissions, and then uh, uh, the whole society will achieve carbon neutrality, um, almost. Right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, here we have uh, done some work to help people to calculate their carbon footprint, especially electricity consumption. For electricity consumption, you know, to calculate our carbon footprint essentially is the emission factor times electricity use, right? Um, and from global electricity generation contribute almost 44% of global uh, emissions. So electricity use and its carbon footprint are really important. Uh, but our electricity power grid is a very complex system. Uh, each small uh, dot here uh, in the US represent a regional power grid. And then after they generate, emission, uh, gen generate electricity, they trade with other regional grid. And for the consumers, the electricity we use essentially is a blend of electricity used by all those uh, uh, regional grids after the you know, complex frequent trading of electricity. Uh, for countries, it's similar. So each country trade with other countries' electricity, especially in Europe, right? Uh, so then if we consider those electricity trading and uh, we get uh, what we can get, and if we don't do electricity trading, we get a wrong emission factor. But unfortunately, most of the carbon footprint counting use the, the wrong emission factors. So if we compare uh, the countries on the left lower left hand side, if we don't consider emission trading, uh, electricity trading, those countries, their uh, electricity emission factors are much uh, underestimated. For example, Switzerland, it's about four or five times difference. It's, it's, it's a lot. So this has a lot of implications because in, in for example, companies in next uh, in Switzerland, Nesto, for example, ne if Nesto want to calculate carbon footprint in, in Switzerland, if we don't consider emission trading, Nesto's carbon footprint will be off by orders magnitude. Right? So lastly, I quickly I want to uh, talk about what is the challenges and the solutions in life cycle analysis. Um, so critical challenge in life cycle analysis is essentially is data. We don't need we don't have a lot of data. Data will uh, traditionally come from on-site investigation, laboratory tests, and all those things are very expensive, time-consuming, right? So that means leads to missing data in life cycle assessment. Um, so um, this you know, uh, motivated us to think about what are the more efficient methods to help us get those data. So we turn our eyes to data science or you know, uh, big data um, you know, commonly known. So for uh, life cycle analysis, what we need is to have a, a big table like this. Each in this table or column represent producing something. For example, producing one gram of paper. Each row to produce this unit of uh, uh, paper, what uh, materials, what energy we need to use as input and what waste being generated for that, right? So um, if we don't know some numbers, which means in this table, we have a lot of holes. So for a table, it's equivalent to a, 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 a network like this, right? The squares here are re, uh, represent the columns, a product. The, the circles represent the rows on, in the table, represent an input or output, right? So filling out uh, this table, essentially equivalent to predict whether a two nodes, uh, there is a link, uh, connecting two nodes and how strong that link is, right? This is called link prediction in IT sector. Uh, it's, it has been used a lot actually. Where has been used? It's used in, in recommendation of products when you do online shopping. For example, if you buy books online, 
and they will recommend you might also like other books. It's a similar network. Uh, uh, there are nodes represents uh, consumers. There are also nodes represent products. So what they do is compare you between purchase history and other users purchase history, right? And then identify those similar ones and then see what they bought you haven't. And then those are the stuff you are most likely to like. So this is essentially equivalent to what we want to do here to predict a link um, between the product node and also, uh, 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 a material in or uh, output node. So we have done some work. Uh, I will skip those uh, technical uh, details. Essentially, we uh, get uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, relatively uh, relatively uh, reputable uh, lifecycle inventory database that uh, you know many people have contributed to up and randomly remove one part of the data and uh, develop link prediction models to uh, estimate the data and then compare our estimation with the removed piece. If they are close enough, then this model works. So then uh, in future, if there are new process coming in, we can use this model to help uh, predict those data. So we have done some experiments. If we remove 1% of data in one column for one product, uh, which is about 770-ish numbers, uh, we can recover those numbers pretty well. So the, 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 this graph uh, essentially um, shows um, if we have more blues, which essentially means you know, well, our, our estimation is very close to uh, the, the, the true value, uh, less than 5% difference. X axis and Y axis are two particular parameters in the model. I don't want to you know, bore you with those technical details. So this uh, one percent data missing is pretty good, and five percent data missing is also pretty good. But if we missing more than ten percent data, uh, the model doesn't work very well because you know the the blue areas becomes much. So this proved that our method is works, but it works only when we have less than 5% data missing. So what happened when uh, more than 5% data missing? Pretty much progress and we are, uh, you know, constantly improve our uh, predictions uh, accuracy. Right now we can achieve some, uh, you know, uh, reasonably good uh, uh, result when there are 10% data missing, but it's still not finalized yet. Um, so this, this is what we think uh, in life cycle analysis, the biggest challenge and the potential solution, uh, data and using data science to help uh, us to predict data. Right? So um, lastly, I want to quickly summarize uh, uh, life cycle thinking uh, has, uh, can play a very important role for uh, carbon neutrality. There are three main roles. Uh, first, to identify key processes uh, that are uh, emission reduction potentials. Second, to avoid um, uh, emissions process to another process. Lastly, to inform consumers to make environmentally or climate conscious decisions. Right? Um, so with that, I, I want to thank the, the organizers again, and uh, thank you for having me, and thank you for uh, listening. I, I realize I over time a little bit, sorry about that. Thank you so much, Professor Mingxu, for very um, deep thinking in terms of about, you know, the carbon neutral neutrality, which we have always actually come across with the media, with, you know, the international treaties. Um, I think there is a question here um, from the Q&A, and I would definitely encourage our attendants to put your comments or questions in the Q&A so that we can actually relay it um, to Professor Xu and to have a discussion. So the question I've got here is about deforestation. So especially, I remember that, you know, there, there is a documentation about how Amazon lost the majority of its forest and definitely it is one of the big, you know, um, big criticize uh, for Brazil actually under this kind of climate change and also what the government is supposed to do. So, this kind of halting deforestation is one of the main themes in the COP26, as Jason Lee has mentioned. Um, so he would like to ask how you think, you know, how important it is to achieve carbon neutrality um, in this regard. 
Ning, your yes. thoughts. Uh, yes. Um, thanks, Jason, for the question. Um, deforestation, of course, is very important. Uh, if we don't stop deforestation, uh, that means um, if we reduce emissions in other uh, sectors, for example, we reduce emission from power sector, uh, not enough, then deforestation will just uh, make that effort go away. Uh, but I also think um, many, um, many of those uh, uh, actions are, are all important. Deforestation, uh, uh, stopping deforestation is important. Um, uh, reduce uh, fossil fuel use in power generation is important and reduce emission from uh, electrify uh, transportation sector is also important. We, we need a, a suite of uh, solutions, not only just one. And uh, um, I, I think the, um, those solutions can come from the technology, different new, new technology, but also can come from the, a lot of uh, policy actions. So uh, it's a uh, long answer, but short answer is, uh, is very important, but uh, you know, um, almost every, everything is important uh, for, for carbon neutrality. Thanks, Ming, for actually answering that question. And I do have some questions to you, and then which you may have a touch a little bit, but actually you have done more work, um, you know, in this field. Um, so the first question is about, you know, when you're talking about this kind of life cycle, it really relates to me when I teach international business. We're talking about the value chain, especially the global value chain when we're looking into the carbon footprint, especially when multinational firms actually involve in those kinds of whole value chain activities. How do you think is it different or maybe quite similar in this kinds of life thinking methodology? I think they are similar, or essentially the same. Um, value chain, I think, is a life cycle thinking. And it's just uh, we use different terms coming from different background. I think value chain uh, coming from the business, uh, business school, I guess. And yeah. life cycle thinking coming from environmental science. Uh, but essentially, I think they're talking about the same thing and just look at the a system from, uh, from a system perspective, not just focus on one particular part. Yeah, I think you're right. We have talked a lot about global value chain. And, and then, you know, I think more is more about the firm's practice strategy and their inter-organizational relationship with the different actors in this value chain. Well, from your background, it's more about environment science. You really go into this kinds of you know, data and to show the footprint, how it looks like, and you can chase that back. So there are lots of things, you know, we actually build on the same platform, but with the different technologies and different methodologies. So there are lots of intersection that we can actually work those in order to understand and how different firms, no matter they are big multinational firms or how small firms, they can actually monitor I think because for the carbon footprint, the most difficult part from scholars and also even for the companies, because it's quite confusing to look at where it comes from, right? Because mm -hmm. like you said, if we just look at one part of the activity, you may ignore actually some other waste and consumption that have already taken place in the other side that you know more work and more responsibilities need to be taken. Yes, absolutely, yes. Um, while we're still waiting for the questions, there are another question because when we look at this life cycle um, value chain, the assumption for us is that those companies, those firms actually engage in this kinds of conventional manufacturing industries so that we know the raw materials need to be sourced, so and so forth. How do you think about the financial service industry might be affected by the carbon neutrality um, pledge? What's your thought uh, yeah. on that? Yes, absolutely. So I didn't look at the, uh, but I showed the chart of Fortune 500 companies uh, commit to carbon neutrality or some sort of uh, actions. I didn't look into which are, what our financial companies are doing. Uh, but I think uh, financial companies are, um, are particularly focused on the, uh, oh, should they play a pretty critical role in terms of the, the investor? You know, investors, as investors, uh, if they promote ESG investing investment, that will help uh, to uh, reduce emissions for for a lot of uh, you know supply chains in a lot of sectors through the companies they invest in. And at the same time, financial companies they don't produce 
uh, you know, too much of uh, physical products, but they also have a pretty long uh, supply chain. And they need to buy stuff, computers, you know, their computers, you know, you probably use a lot of electricity. Those are all uh, carbon footprint, those of the, the financial companies. They also should, uh, you know, pay use their carbon footprint there. Yeah, related to what you just mentioned, there are more questions actually um, floating here. So I think um, which relates to this kinds of uh, manufacturing and also the marketing aspect, because um, I make, sorry if I do not pronounce your name properly, um, mentioned that, you know, how important a reliable labeling um, is for achieving carbon neutrality. Um, because personally, he or she think that, you know, in Europe, we do not have this kind of labeling um, in the products and the services. Does such labeling exist in China? Do you want to share some of your experience and your observations? Um, in China, not much. Um, there's no, uh, I, I, I didn't see uh, too many of uh, products uh, have uh, the, with the uh, carbon footprint label. Um, but uh, since, you know, since uh, year the government pledged to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060, many, um, many companies or many industry uh, trade groups have started to talk, to talk about, uh, you know, a lot of things to do to, to, uh, in response to carbon neutrality policy. One of the things you know, have dis been discussing in the news, in in those uh, meetings, uh, is um, create a uh, you know for some for the same industries to create a carbon uh, label uh, standard, right, and get uh, you know certified by third party, etc. I see you know those are coming, but not uh, yet. Yeah, I agree with me. Is that there's definitely something under the pipe. And you know to talk about you know how to make how the mechanism can work out and then how the monitoring system needs to be there in place in order to see um, you know how the government would like to regulate um, the, the way how the business and how the different parties actually working in, in this mm -hmm. regard. Um, there is another question by Helena Wee and um, talking about do you think carbon trading should be included in life cycle thinking? If we're to convince companies to be truly accountable um, for their carbon outputs, um, because I totally understand where this question is coming from, because there are lots of things talking about greenwashing, SDG washing, um, because the companies do have those kinds of pressure uh, for corporate social responsibility and sustainable responsibility. Um, but most of the time, we found out and then re referred to one of my undergraduate students did a uh, report talking about, you know, those kinds of self-reporting of their green activity actually may not be exactly as reported by the third party. So the question back to you is that do you think carbon trading should be included in life cycle thinking and how to actually offset or how to really make it a truly green activity instead of greenwashing? Um, well, I, I think, um, uh, if I don't, if I understand the question correctly, I think life cycle thinking uh, we can include carbon trading in life cycle thinking as long as the the question we are looking at uh, is relevant to um, uh, carbon trading. So life cycle thinking is a way of think uh, uh, thinking is is a, is a methodology. Uh, it can apply to to many things uh, as long as as long as the thing that you're looking at involves carbon trading, um, you know, of course, um, why not? Um, but, I, uh, but I think a more, um, another question, uh, similar question will be very, also very important is whether carbon trading should be thinking, right? Because as far as I know, most of the carbon trading schemes around the world uh, are, are, are focusing on the emissions directly coming uh, uh, a, a, a company that is involved in the carbon trading, right? Um, but at the same time, we can also think that um, a company, if 
for example, Microsoft. If Microsoft really uh, reduces its carbon footprint, including the, the, uh, its own emission and auto supply chains by 2030, maybe, uh, maybe Microsoft can also use that uh, uh, reduction to sell those in, in the market, in the carbon trading market. Right? So that will probably um, give more incentives for reduce their, uh, uh, not only their own emissions, but also their supply chain emissions. So I think that's, that's also uh, important to think about. Uh, in, in terms of greenwashing, I think, um, yeah, there are a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, issues there, but um, I think it's getting better uh, uh, then, uh, you know, like 10 years ago, 10 years ago, you know, everybody is just calculate their carbon footprint by their own and, uh, you know, put, put the, their website. But now these days there are international organizations, uh, standards available, then the companies should follow those standards uh, to be transparent. Uh, of course, not everybody is doing that, but I think more and more companies are uh, going to that, towards that direction. And also we need science uh, uh, tools, methods, uh, and databases to help them to uh, quantify their carbon emissions. So that's you know, what you know, scientific community can help. Yeah, I think we just actually touch upon the questions <clears throat> proposed by Francisco and Godano. When we're talking about science and also the data definitely help us to have a better understanding of how carbon footprint you know, um, traces and how the companies can do. Um, but Francisco also raised the concern is that, you know, the data science will help to actually calculate, doing the calculation, the technological solutions such as machine learning can sometimes have a significant carbon footprint themselves. Mm -hmm. So in this, um, do you think this is a concern in your research? Uh, it's not a concern in my research because the kind of machine learning stuff we do is a very is not that powerful, so I don't think it will uh, generate too much of carbon footprint. Um, but you, you're right; uh, um, those big companies um, they 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 have machine learning models running algorithm running all the time in a very large scale. Um, kind of thing is big data centers, right? Data centers use a lot of energy, and uh, um, of course, you know, if the energy coming from then a lot of emissions, right? So there are actually a lot of uh, uh, research, good research uh, have, have been published to quantify uh, energy uh, use emissions from um, data centers, from uh, even uh, running just a simple algorithm, right? So there are a lot of good stuff there in the literature. At the same time, I think the IT sector have also uh, IT sector has also realized this issue. Um, I think Google, uh, for example, has um, a couple of years ago has already uh, promised that by you know 2030 or something I don't remember exact time data centers will be carbon neutral. Meaning they're still going to run their data centers, but they're they're going to run their data centers using renewable energy, not using um, this energy. So. Um, I think you know the practitioners have realized that, and the you know scientific company, uh, community has, has has also realized that. Yeah, I totally agree with me. Is that it? Really depends on you know how how consistent and how large those kinds of uh, running the machine really is. I think this also particularly related to one of their emerging industry, the Bitcoin. So there are lots of for data mining, which cause lots of carbon footprint and under spotlight and saying that we're quite concerned on how much pollution and consumption of energy on this particular industry has caused. Um, I think, you know, back to what we have discussed and uh, what may have provided us. Let's come back to the context of China, because, you know, when China, when President Xi actually talked about carbon neutrality by 2060, um, actually, it raised lots of debates and concerns in international arena about, you know, the motivation behind um, this political 
either slogan or you know um, the goal. And the more important thing is about the feasibility. So um, I mean, what do you think about it? You know, do you think that how will China reach carbon neutrality? And then is it just a shift in policy language rather than practice? Because this is what lots of for the negative side of for the comments actually coming from. So from your expertise and from your past research and your ongoing research. So how realistic do you think that China might be able to achieve the carbon neutrality by 2060? Um, my personal opinion is that uh, it's it's very feasible, but I ha I didn't do any research, so it's just uh, you know uh, uh, educated guess I think. But I have seen people many um, many uh, pr uh, prominent scholars in China and also um, uh, from other countries uh, have 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 spent time to um, uh, to exam to to study the issue all feasible uh, for that uh, 2060 target and uh, what is uh, what are the possible pathways uh, I've seen people uh, uh, published and uh, also presented in at various uh, events um, there are actually a lot of uh, uh, technology first of all technology available uh, to to reduce emissions uh, in in those uh, so, several um, uh, those heavy uh, uh, emission industry, industry, for example, in the power industry, right? Um, so um, and also transportation industry. And uh, um, I think for carbon neutrality, essentially, uh, if you just look from the emission reduction uh, point of view, essentially, it's just power sector and the transportation sector are the uh, perhaps two biggest players. And the you know uh, the the electricity electric vehicle penetration is very fast in China, probably the fattest in the world. Right? So if all the most of majority of the transportation fleet is electrified, and then uh, the power grid is clean, a uh, cleaner becomes cleaner uh, using less uh, coal, less uh, fossil uh, fossil energy, and uh, more renewable energy. And renewable energy, renew, renewable energy, electricity has also been developing rapidly in China as well. So I think, um, I, I believe it, it will be uh, feasible, um, but you know, um, uh, again, this is not my is I can only just uh, do an educated guess. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing your Academic, as I think it's really humble, you know, statements that you have put it here, given that you have done lots of research. Um, I think to add upon that one, because I recently wrote an article for Amcham and in, in Shanghai, we're talking about a debate and um, whether this is just a China and try to propose a political stance rather than just being uh, more realistic in achieving. So I shared a similar con sim similar thought with you because I think, you know, once China has set up certain kinds of strategic goal, then there will be lots of resources maneuvered and exploited in order to achieve that. And over the past decades that we have seen that China has become greener in terms of the investment into renewable industry. And also, as you have mentioned here, that China's electrical vehicles, not just actually the household cars, but also the buses, coaches, and taxis, those actually more commercial use actually have already bypassed and the production standard and also reach the production volume and across the world. So those are the positive signs that we can actually see from the historical development. And more importantly, um, the 14th and um, for a five year plan also actually seeing the overall plan about how China is going to relocate different regions in terms of for, um, the renewable um, energy development. So there are lots of uh, prospectors that we are confident to some extent that this carbon neutrality by 2060 can be achieved, but definitely only the history can tell, right? And then so we, we can't predict what the future will be, but we definitely can keep an eye on it. Um, mm -hmm. How do you think about, you know, the other countries? Because if we look at COP26, you know, lots of media talking about China actually is the largest um, account holder um, for the climate change because of the total consumption. But so it is America, India, and other countries. Um, but do you think this kind of life cycle thinking um, have been already implemented in those countries or actually there's still a long way to go? Still a long way to go. Um, as I said, in you know, life cycle thinking in this space, mostly it's 
and to help from this consumption side of uh, uh, approach to uh, for carbon neutrality. Um, at the early stage, when when when, when we start to um, thinking about uh, carbon neutrality, uh, the well, first of all, there will be some low hanging fruits, and then uh, and that mostly coming from the top down from the government. Uh, because you know we cop as you said you know we we, we hear com many um, um, government uh, uh, countries uh, committed to achieve carbon neutrality by some certain times. Um, so the top down approach, I think, uh, will come in place first, um, uh, coming from you know from a policy driven uh, driven by policy, and then uh, when, as some later on in the in the process. For example, in in a, you know around 20, 30, 40 ish, when the those low hanging fruits or the policy driven approach has um, has has reached reached to its limit, and then a consumption based approach like thinking uh, could start to uh, um, play a more important role there to complement uh, what the top down approach has. So I think you know it, it, it should uh, it still have a long way to go, but uh, it will come in later. I think in this process. Yeah, let's hope for the best, and then definitely yeah. prepare for the worst. <laughs> and this is always that I tell my students and also you know the research colleagues, you know, because I think this is really a big issue for everyone across the world. It's not about China to reach carbon neutrality actually it down to every single citizen um, in the globe to think about, especially, you know, when um, former President Obama just actually had his talk um, at COP26 in Glasgow, he talked about, you know, how England nations should also be part of the picture, while most of the spotlight have been coming to those kinds of more powerful countries. So Ming, I think we're about to, to conclude today's very exciting and very knowledgeable Talk given by you, but do you want to do you want to actually give maybe very short, brief sentence or messages to the audience, and you know to highlight um, the topic or what you you think about from today's seminar? Okay, all right, thanks. Um, so um, I think achieving carbon neutrality will affect everyone um, around the world from working in any. Uh, every uh, industry, and uh, um, we need both the top-down and bottom-up approach. And the life cycle thinking will be important from the bottom-up perspective. Great, thank you so much, Ming, for your time, and then and all the best for your research in this field. And then definitely, we would put you in touch with some of our audience because they definitely want to um, get more advice from you regarding the literature in those kinds of data science and so on and so forth. And thank you very much for all the attendance and spare your time and participate in today's seminar and also raise very interesting questions for us to discuss. And I hope that you have a very well-deserved rest afterwards and we're going to see you next week. Great, Bye. thank you very much, bye-bye.